behalf of my colleagues from OEL and also from the Thompson Center for Learning and Teaching, we would like to welcome you to this event. It's going to be about Open Michigan and Open Education Resources. And Emily is our presenter from Ann Arbor. She is an Open Education uh, Coordinator and also a member of the Open Michigan team. And um, yes, she's going to talk about her initiative or the group she's a member of and then also generally about open education resources, how to create them, and also how to utilize them for our purposes or for using our teaching and learning. Um, so I, I want this to be pretty conversational and um, pretty relaxed because we do have a small group of people and Open Michigan is we are based in on the Ann Arbor campus, but we're really interested in working with the different campuses at the, in the state of Michigan. So that's something that if you have questions about what I'm talking about, or have comments, or have ideas for how we can partner or collaborate, and how Open Michigan can serve this community, then I'm very interested in that. So please feel free to just interrupt me. And I'm, I'm going to be going through a lot of different things, so um, if there's something that you need clarification on or anything, just let me know. So um, I'll, be, I'll be pretty casual. So um, this is what we're kind of going to go over. I'm, I'm trying to give you guys a really broad overview of the landscape that has emerged recently with the opportunities that have emerged with digital resources and a, an interconnectivity that we have available to us now through on the internet and through online resources that are created and how this is changing the, the teaching landscape, the publishing landscape, and all of these opportunities that are coming up to kind of break down some of the silos of education that have been created over the past several years and how to use copyright and use open licenses in a way that allows us to share resources not only across our different campuses here, but with other institutions in the state and in the rest of the world. So we're going to go over, the, the meat of the presentation will be in this first part where I'll try to give you a, a background of what open educational resources are, of where we come from, and the larger landscape. So what other initiatives and organizations are involved in this activity and these movements, and um, also give you a little bit of a background about copyright and Creative Commons licenses because that is really closely tied with how we produce these materials that can actually be shared and adapted by other teachers and students in their own context. And then I'll kind of talk about a little bit more about the mechanics of this, try to teach you some tools and some resources so that you can use open educational resources or create open educational resources in your own work. And then um, just part three is really just that, um, how you can get involved with Open Michigan, the things that we specifically do and offer for the learning community that we support, and um, opening up some of those questions that Andrea posed in the initial flyer. So having that conversation about what do you guys think about these resources? What do you think about copyright? How do you think that this could fit into your own specific context? So, so that's what we're gonna be doing today. And um, again, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. So uh, Open Michigan was founded in 2007, and we were a pilot project that was hosted and is still hosted by the University of Michigan's Medical School. And they wanted the first two years of the educational materials that they create on campus to be available openly licensed to other institutions, other teachers, and other learners, so that somebody without University of Michigan credentials could see and access the resources that we create. Because they, partly because they feel like they are a leader in the med medical education world, and they wanted to showcase that. But we also have these kind of underlying values that we believe that as a public university especially, we have an imperative to share the knowledge and the resources that we create with other institutions and with other people, especially learners in Michigan. And we also believe that transparency is a way to grow and to make a healthy educational institution so that people see the high quality of the resources that we create, that you know, UM Flint creates or UM Ann Arbor creates. They see 
the type of innovation that's happening at our organization, at our institution, and they can just they can see what we're teaching. So they know where, especially for a public institution, taxpayers know where their money is going. So those are kind of some of the underlying beliefs that we founded Open Michigan with. Um, and specifically, our mission is to try to maximize the academic and creative impact of the teachers and the resources that are created at the University of Michigan, so on all of the different campuses. And what we have organized that around are ways to find, share, and connect with this larger community and larger organization. And what the find looks like is actually our um, materials that we publish. So Open Michigan works with staff members to publish their resources and their teaching materials that they create as open educational resources and then we house those. So we are kind of like a small publishing unit in one respect. And we also um, teach a lot about how, I teach different con um, constituents and partners how to share the resources. So that's what I'm doing today is teaching you about how you can actually take advantage of these opportunities. And um, we have developed a lot of do-it-yourself resources. We have a lot of presentations and slides and materials up, and that's the share part, that we try to offer the opportunity for people to learn about this and use them in their everyday teaching lives. And um, so we have, I'll show you, at the very end of the presentation, we also have a wiki that we've created that has a ton of resources that we use for training various people. We have a volunteer program as well. And then the Connect is really where we're making an effort to help people realize that these kinds of activities that increase transparency and increase this fostering of information and information sharing and creativity is actually happening in a lot of different places and a lot of different ways on campus. So a lot of people are doing this on their own and they're not necessarily associated with Open Michigan, which is absolutely fine, but they're, they're using the concepts of open access and open information to get their materials out there to share with others and to promote their materials and to get feedback on their materials. So those are kind of the facets of what we do. And I'll go into the details of that later on as we get involved in talking about what we do locally at, on our campus. So um, this is an example of, of OER that we create, what we call OER often. Um, this is actually a class that one of my colleagues at Open Michigan taught that was online that was for Flint. So um, this is there our only UM Flint class that we have right now, and we're hoping to get more um, as we grow. But it, it looks like a lot of things, and this is how we present it. So you see that we have a short description that people can access. We have all of the different pieces of the learning of the course that we have worked with to um, make available for people to download as an entire unit. They can download the whole thing, or they can just look at certain parts of it. So they can look at the syllabus, the learning objectives, the schedule, that kind of thing. So we try to make it accessible in a couple of different ways for people. And um, we also try to link to any information about the university, the course, um, the department, and, and that kind of uh, information as well to show people that this is part of the teaching and learning landscape at the University of Michigan more broadly. So, and we'll talk about the, the different aspects of these more too, but basically we work with open educational resources because we believe that not just courses are important to share, but all of the learning materials that kind of can be created on campus are important to share. So that also includes staff um, manuals that staff create or tutorials that staff create to work with students or that they use to work with faculty members. So those aspects of the, the teaching and learning community are also important. We also work with librarians to, to gather the materials that they have developed and created to support their community and make those openly licensed so that they're adaptable. So we've, we know that we have these barriers to education. Um, and we see these in a lot of different contexts and to several different types of degrees. But some of the things that we've realized that having 
openly licensed adaptable resources available to the world, the global learning community, um, addresses are these issues of limited resources and overcrowding. So, for example, we partner with an institution, a couple of different institutions in Africa, and they have a very skewed teacher to student ratio. They teach 30 or 40 students in a clinical setting where they don't, they can't, the faculty member literally can't speak to everyone, you know, they can't necessarily be heard. And so they have decided to use open educational resources to address that gap and provide students with the materials that they would teach during that section, during that class. So on a, they actually share it on a disk they, so that they load it up into a computer because they don't have the connectivity, the internet connectivity that we have. So OER, that's one aspect of OER that we think about often is that it's online, but it can be print materials, it can be a digital resource that's on a DVD or on a desk, it can be all sorts of different things. But they've used those to address the gap of having limited resources and overcrowding in their school systems to make sure that the education that they're providing for their students is high quality and that they're learning the objectives that they need to, to succeed as doctors. Um, we also know that this addresses kind of the issues of cost in a lot of situations. We have faculty members on our um, Ann Arbor campus that are using um, open textbooks, an online version of a textbook, so that students can actually interact with this. They can support the growth and the updating of these textbooks, keep them up to date, keep them, kind of quality check them with the support of the faculty member. And they can print on demand if they want to or they can do something like they can only access it on a computer in a computer lab instead of having to buy an expensive textbook. So these are kind of the uses and the, the gaps that some of these openly licensed materials address for the different teaching landscapes. Um, and we also know, you know that a lot of times we at the University of Michigan have a lot of resources that we have available to us. The, the Ann Arbor campus has a very robust library with that spends a lot of money on the subscriptions that we pay for and the materials, the, the research materials that we have at the beck and call of our students and our faculty members, but that's not always the case for other institutions even in our state. And so that's something that by providing these different kinds of teaching and learning materials, we can help support some of the local efforts of other schools that may not have the money to put back on the different subscriptions that we have or the, the facilities. So it's it's not kind of a one-to-one -one replacement, but it's something that we've found helps different institutions in their specific contexts. So those are the, the barriers that we've encountered and those are the ways that um, what we're doing with openly licensed materials kind of helps to alleviate some of those issues. And we realized that, I've kind of talked about this, that we can provide high quality materials to other institutions. And it's not that we necessarily just completely give them away and then they're gone, but we actually get to say, look at the University of Michigan's resources, look at what we have. This is the faculty member who created those resources. This is what they can do in their teaching environment. And we are able to offer opportunities for faculty members to collaborate across institutions because people see the resources that someone's teaching and they say, I, I want to talk to you about that. So we've had that. We've also been able to um, apply some of our resources to people who, faculty members who want to showcase this for their uh, reviews so they can show not only the research that they've done, but how well they've done in the classroom as far as creating these robust materials. And so it offers them another avenue for showcasing their work. And so, stepping back a little bit, I'm gonna talk about some of the definitions. So I've been using this open educational resources, open, and sharing, and licenses, and what do those things actually mean? Um, a lot of this is, is wrapped up in some words and some concepts that have to be unpacked a little bit. So um, so we're going to step back and talk about what these different things are because these are related concepts that kind of create an ecosystem of sharing and um, 
of material creation in the academic world that is emerging and starting to become much more standardized in the practices of large institutions. So Open Michigan operates on the concept that we create resources, independent resources, that can be attached to a course or separate from a course. So that's what I was talking about earlier with regard to how we work with staff members and student projects and other activities that are may, may not be something for like psychology 101, but it's something that supports the teaching and the learning environment. So we think that that's really important. And one of the aspects of the work that we do is that we always license our materials so that they can be adapted because we believe that's a fundamental aspect of the sharing process that is important for students and faculty and learners, self-learners at other institutions to be able to localize the work that we create and use that in their own classroom settings. And I'm going to go into some of the reasons why we believe that with the copyright discussion in a little bit. But um, one of the other terms that I'll, I'll throw out there a little bit is OCW or open courseware. And that was one of the large first movements of all of this activity. And um, you'll see in a couple minutes some slides that so MIT does open courseware, Tufts does open courseware, Stanford, Purdue, some other places do that. So they only take materials that are associated with a specific course that fit that course's learning objectives and they make them openly licensed. But we're a little bit broader than that with our, our perspective and what we want to take in at the University of Michigan and what we want to promote and publish at the University of Michigan. And then um, we were talking about this a little bit. The open access movement is a broad whole range of activities that kind of came out of the computing world with open software development, um, people being able to develop code with each other in different locations, um, getting away from that proprietariness of code creation and software creation. And that has moved into the publishing world. And so a lot of universities, including Michigan, are starting to work in open journals and publish in open journals and to encourage their faculty members who are publishing materials to consider open journals and consider open publishing as an alternative to, again, a, a proprietary system where the faculty member actually gives away their copyright through a contract to the journal instead of being able to retain their copyright and retain a little bit of ownership over that material that they create, that publication, that journal article. So um, one of the facets of that is that open access is not always associated with a license, an open license, that allows it to be adaptable. So you see open access as a large bubble, but not everything that's open access is OER, for example. So that leads us to the bubbles. <laughs> um, so if you think of this, open access is this very broad movement. It's, it's often free resources. It's something where people do retain copyright, but it's not always adaptable. And then open educational resources is something that overlaps with that, that is a little bit more specific about how we work in this ecosystem and how we choose to share our resources through the copyright licenses that we apply to them and the open licenses that we apply to them. So that gives you a little bit of perspective. And then this is where open courseware fits in. So a lot of what we produce at Open Michigan looks like open courseware, and it is, but we also produce other things that are um, bibliographies, image banks, tutorials, and I'll show you some examples of those things, websites that will license openly so that others can use them. So um, OCW really focuses on sharing specific content developed to support a specific course. So does that make sense to everyone, or does anybody have any questions about how that works? Because that's, a, a, that's kind of a big picture. And, Question? Or you just kind of feel it? Yeah, I'm trying to comprehend where the lines 
where, where things are separated. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it, to date, people are still kind of pushing on those lines a little bit. So, so we've taken a stance that we are going to, at Open Michigan, license all of our materials with Creative Commons licenses that make them adaptable, but not everyone does that. And so, so, when, <clears throat> so when you license educational materials, then when someone adapts them, they have to give credit to the original? Yep. Mm -hmm. And what, that's one of the things that we're trying to foster, is that good behavior of giving credit to the people that create is, the materials. Is there a, a formal uh, permission process to use the material once you find something that you can adapt? Can, is permission granted through your office, or is it's, it an application form online? How does that work? It, um, oh, yes, uh, I'll go into that. Um, just secure for a minute. Um, by applying a Creative Commons license on the materials that you create, you are proactively giving permission to users that would adapt the work later. And you get to determine by a combination of licenses how you want those people to share it. So you are saying you don't have to contact my office or me to use this. I give you permission. But you have to use it in the ways that I specify that, you want, that I want you to use it. And the license, I'll explain the license, but it is um, something that is both, it's human readable, machine readable, and legal code. And I'll, you'll see a graph about that. Um, and the license will always, if you, if you do it properly, you can link the license to digital, on digital resources back to the license agreement so that somebody can click on that and read the terms that you have specified that they can use your material in. So it encourages, it actually encourages people to properly cite the resources that they create. And that's one of the issues that I'll go into is that with the internet, it's an amazing opportunity to share, but it has spawned a lot of copyright infringement because people just grab things from Google searches and grab things in these places and don't actually cite their resources. And that's one of the things that we're trying to foster is that appropriate citation and use of these materials in a legal fashion because oftentimes people don't even realize that they're infringing on copyright when they take something. So, and one of the reasons why we put the um, contact information of faculty members on our resources is we want that faculty member, number one, to be credited, but we also want people to be able to contact them if they have questions or want to collaborate or want to learn more about the other resources that they create. And we've actually seen that, so. So what happens if someone does not comply? The same thing it happens if somebody takes, um, plagiarizes. We, you know, we, we are not, we can't be police. So if it happens within our institution, it's the same, or it falls under the same issues with plagiarism, student plagiarism or anything like that, that we could say, you took this and you didn't give proper credit. Um, but we, we're, we have seen with the licenses that people, it's easier for people to realize that they do need to credit their material. So we can't police that once we've published it, but we have gotten feedback that people are using the licenses appropriately from, from the feedback, which is anecdotal, which are people telling us those things that, oh, hey, I didn't realize this. I didn't realize what I was doing was improper until you taught me about this or I saw this license and it made me realize what's behind you know, what's behind the Creative Commons license and what's behind copyright. Um, and I'll go into copyright a little bit more, but copyright, your work automatically, all your notes are copyrighted right now because they're, that's the way the law works. You don't even have to um, register it or anything like that. So, but, but that, yeah. So is it, is it primarily an honor system? I mean, how, how would the, the violation of the license be detected? Mm -hmm. It is primarily an honor system. It's, it's basically the same thing that happens today. It's the same type of honor system with work. If you get caught, then you get caught, and you fall under the, the regular purview of the judicial system with copyright infringement. But you just you have to get caught. So. Does your system show you who's agreeing to the licenses? Well. That's the, the issue with the Creative Commons licenses that you, you give that permission already. So you give it proactively despite not knowing who the user may be. But we do know, um, you know, we can measure through different types of analytics where our resources are being downloaded. So most of our materials actually are being used 
within the University of Michigan system and within our partner institutions. Um, but we also have resources that have been used all over the world, so that have been accessed and downloaded. So, so it's it's a different. It's kind of a like a parallel system to the traditional proprietary all rights reserved in the respect that you publish it, you own the copyright. You still own the copyright when you put Creative Commons licenses on your work. You're just telling people how you would like them to share it instead of saying you absolutely have to get permission. It's saying this is what I can let you do or what I want you to do. So, and, and I'm going to go and explain a little bit more of that. So if you have more questions when I bring those slides up, feel free to ask. So them. other than your analytics, uh, there's really no way, the way it's working now, to know exactly who is using the work or where. No. So. It wouldn't um, be with any other copyright either. Right. Right. So. right. It's the same thing as, as other copyright issues. You know, once you publish it, it's, it's out there, but, but the practice of applying this license that people can easily read means that they are they have more opportunities to educate themselves about how they're using the license and how, or how they're using the material that's being licensed. So instead of what happens with a lot of issues on the internet is that things get grabbed and taken out of context and you never you don't know who created it originally. So this is like a trail that the users know who created it, it, even if the person who created it doesn't necessarily know who those users are. But it increases that likelihood that you will be properly attributed for your work, and your work will be used in a legal manner. So, okay. So, so this is what I was talking about. These are examples of different institutions that use open educational resources, create open educational resources, or create open courseware. So. Um, there are a lot of others. Um, we have we have institutions like the Hewlett, or we have funding institutions like the Hewlett Foundation that funds a lot of these initiatives. They put a lot of money into the creation of open educational resources, and they put a lot of infrastructure support into it. Um, we have UNESCO is also involved in creating open educational resources, and we have a lot of other kind of international consortia and international institutions that are participating in these things. We now have an open courseware consortium that is kind of like a um, large body of different, a membership body of different institutions that pay membership and they have conferences, they share best practices, they provide training to each other and try to support the growth of this and the standardization of this. But we also have, we found that um, a lot of institutions with our, our institutional partners in Africa, they're able to do a lot of really amazing things with their the creation of their open educational resources to grow, build programs, and to also create new programs. So it's really been a, a boom for them to be able to address some of their traditional gaps in education that they've had. So um, on in the scholarly world, there are other institutions that also participate in open licensing and in sharing objects. Not all of Merlot's materials are openly licensed, but they are specifically designed for use by teachers in a, a, a closed learning context. Um, and we have, I don't know how many people are familiar with Merlot. Um, what does that stand for again? Like, oh, the Multimedia Educational Resource for Learning and Online Teaching. So, so they are, so they've created all of these learning objects that are, you know, supporting um, teaching activities, so lesson plans and all sorts of supporting materials, and they are starting to openly license those so that they can be used in across different types of institutions and across different places where um, maybe you're a self-learner or you need to learn something else and you, you don't have that kind of fair use umbrella, but you need to learn it in a different context. And So they're, they're starting to think about ways that we can make these adaptable. And the National Science Foundation has also started promoting the use of open licenses in their work. So if you get an NSF grant, you, there's a clause in there that people are starting to have to obey that says that you need to, that states that you need to openly license some facet of your work. And so, and think about those ramifications. So it's starting to permeate into a lot of different sectors within the educational structure. And Spark is another 
um, organizations, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resource Coalition. And they work mostly with libraries to encourage um, transparency and um, encourage open publishing practices and practices that allow uh, other institutions to share the resources that are created at, for example, the University of Michigan. So, so kind of on a local scale in the academic world um, that supports the creation of these materials. These are two organizations that also work with this. And then on our campus, we have a, the Deep Blue is an institutional repository that Open Michigan puts all of their resources into. So that's one of the benefits to working with us is that, I mean, you can do this yourself as a faculty member, but we make sure that the teaching material that you create is in a stable place, that it's not on a website that's going to go crash or that's going to get deleted from a server or updated and lose material, lose formatting. It's in the place that it will be preserved so that you can access it and other people can access it later. So um, they and they, um, do a lot of work with making these resources available for a sustainable period of time, so archiving the resources that are created. And then um, our library system has just recently adopted, they've used an open license, used a Creative Commons license for a couple of years on their all of the resources that they create. But they just recently um, changed from, which this is one of your handouts, the, we'll go over these, the um, CC BY and C license to the CC BY, which CC is Creative Commons and BY means attribution, so it means you have to be attributed for your work. So that's kind of what we're talking about with sharing work and, and getting proper attribution for what you're doing and proper credit for it. Um, but they, they just recently moved into using a more open version of the Creative Commons license for their work. So, and they've heard from different institutions that um, other libraries are using the, li the lib guides, the live guides that they create for their own work. So it's actually had some direct benefits to some of the, I think it's some regional libraries. So, so can our faculty use the blue or do we have to have our own system similar to I don't know the answer to that. I think that you probably could, but I can look that up for you. I got a card in my mailbox. Yeah, so I, I think it's okay. you know, like yeah. campus, you know, all, all the campuses can use it. So, so it's something to, to think about that you can put in student theses are starting to go into this, learning materials, publications, things like that that we still own copyright to um, can go into this. So it's, it's, it's to try to keep that a stable digital record of materials that we're increasingly producing online that are born digital. <clears throat> and this is the organization, Wikimedia Foundation, is an organization that supports Wikipedia. So if you've used that or if you know about that um, in your classrooms or in your personal life, um, they are trying to support the growth of high quality vetted articles within their online encyclopedia. And they recently, they're about to end this public policy initiative where they've partnered with a bunch of different schools and faculty members and public policy schools across the country to incorporate an assignment into the class where the students actually create an article for Wikipedia based on the research that they're doing in class and they get graded on it. So it fits with the learning objectives of the faculty, but the output of it, instead of just a, a, a piece of paper that the student throws away or you know that gets put somewhere, is something that actually can help other people. And they did this with public policy because public policy is a controversial, very dynamic, very interdisciplinary field. And they felt like they could, they needed some high quality information in these worlds. So students and faculty get to choose what they do, but this is an example of how um, open, openly sharing and openly licensing the materials that you create in the classroom are having an impact on how other people can learn and improving the access that other people that are not necessarily affiliated with that institution can access this information and learn from it. So, so the student has control over that. The student posted on there. They have. They work with um, campus ambassadors 
So the student can get training to, to post um, the material, but it will go through a vetted process and, and oftentimes the campus ambassadors will post the material. Um, but they, the work that the students create is, has already been graded by the faculty member book by the time it gets up there. So it's not just like draft notes or in, inaccurate information, it's been checked. Actually. So if the student got a D on it, could it be posted? Or would the campus ambassadors select or recommend against a poorly done paper? I don't, yeah, I don't know about that detail, but I would imagine that probably the successful and A um, articles are the ones that get published. So I would imagine if a student didn't perform very well, then that, that's not, Wikipedia doesn't strive to put up inaccurate or poor quality information. So yeah, I, don't, I don't think that that would happen. <laughs> it probably wouldn't do very well overall in the class. If they, were, if they didn't write an article that met the standards, the high standards of Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Foundation. Well, if the student can't post himself, then that would indicate that there is some kind of gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. The student can't post to himself. Well, yeah, I don't know, like, I know that they have the uh, faculty that works with this initiative is always paired with the campus ambassador, mm -hmm. and the campus ambassador is trained on how to upload and use the wiki and in the policies of Wikimedia Foundation, so making sure that that information is appropriate. So, so it's kind of channeled from student to faculty to the Wikipedia, so. So it's not a completely open system, but it is something that allows student work to be featured that's high quality work. So. And then students can, you know, say that they contributed to something like this too. Okay, so that is kind of the general landscape of different organizations that are moving around in the open access world, in um, using Creative Commons licenses, in starting to promote these best practices and high quality information practices. And so we're kind of switching gears to copyright details. So are there any other questions about? Can you just back up one slide? Because I see that you have a Creative Commons, no, next one, there. The PD Gov, mm -hmm. that's a Creative Commons license level. That is actually what we, what Open Michigan created to kind of keep teaching people about what the information that they see is and where it comes from. So Creative Commons, I'll show you the slide in a little bit, has these licenses, but we have developed kind of the same icon system to show people where other types of materials come from. So for example, that is um, ineligible for copyright because it is created by the government. So that, that PD stands for public domain. And so there are materials that have either expired in their copyright or that have been given to public domain because of how they were created, or if because of the um, creator wanting to put them in public domain, which means that they have no ownership, copyright ownership over that anymore. And anything that's created by the government is public domain. So we just put that on there so that people see that and they, they have a key in all of the resources that we create that explains each of these little icons, and it just helps educate people to think about where their material is coming from. So, in other words, what you have up there on that slide isn't copyrightable. Right. It's public domain from a government source. Mm -hmm. Because the government created it. So. so, this is the most recent kind of um, influential uh, piece of Copyright Act from 1976. And this is where copyright was initially um, kind of set forth in our Constitution. It, it wasn't like this is our copyright law, but the Constitution kind of set the groundwork for how copyright developed in the United States. And it was initially intended to foster innovation and creativity and protect artists from consumer interests. And um, since then, it has kind of been increasingly scoped so that it makes it harder and harder for people to share resources with each other and actually do that innovation and be creative about the works that they create. And so um, these are the issues that copyright today um, makes, makes everyone who holds copyright have to give explicit permission for people to do these four, five things. So for example, like I said with your notes, like I would have to get permission to reproduce it in whole or in part, or 
do any kind of derivative work so I can't translate it into another language if nobody speaks English and maybe, you know, I do, but I also speak French and somebody wants to read your work. Um, you can't do any kind of dramatization with it, you can't distribute it, and you can't publicly perform or display the work. And that's kind of where copyright gets really tricky with um, different kinds of educational context. So we think of the classroom as a closed setting, but that's increasingly not happening these days, where students are learning in different places, people are learning in different settings, self-learners are learning you know, all over the place. And so this copyright is kind of breaking down, because it's not serving our interests anymore, and it's not serving our needs. And that's why the Creative Commons organization has come up with these opportunities to a license your work that you're still, you know, you still own the copyright, but you're giving people permission to do these kinds of things in whatever way and combination that you want to give them that permission. So, if that makes sense. So, like I was saying, copyright occurs automatically when something gets fixed. So, it also means that any blog post or tweet or thing that you put up online is automatically copyrighted all rights reserved, which means that technically anybody who uses that is supposed to get your permission unless you tell them how you want to share that resource. So I just keeps going forward. Um, so basically like almost everything we create is copyrighted and copyrighted all rights reserved. So it, re it really makes it easy to infringe on that copyright, especially in the internet. So that's kind of what this is about. What we talked about before, it, the internet makes it so easy to share that the, the, the law of copyright has not really caught up to the practice of what we engage in as consumers of information, producers of information, and as teachers and as learners. And so that's where um, we are really working with Creative Commons and other institutions to try to figure out ways that we can legally and successfully and productively share this information. So, Creative Commons, if you, if these are the distinctions. Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization. It's an international organization. They're based in California, and they have a whole team of lawyers and legal expertise at their um, working for them that at their disposal that creates these licenses so that they can be used in different legal settings. So they have created licenses that can be used all over the world. And they have also created licenses that can only be used in certain jurisdictions in certain countries. So you'll see a Creative Commons office or license from, you know, Argentina might be slightly different from our licenses here. But in a lot of situations, they've created ways for people to share internationally and not have to fear that copyright infringement. So this is what I was talking about earlier. They have created a different kind of system where it's kind of human, machine, and legal, legal readable. So you have the license that is pretty simple to understand once you can recognize what Creative Commons is. So it is the CC BY, the little icon. So that's something that says, hey, I'm a license, pay attention to me. And kind of says, this is, this is what your terms and agreements are. And then if people click those and link those, it actually has a code, a computer code embedded in it that makes that searchable and findable on the internet. So it actually makes your resources more findable if you use this license because search engines can pull it up um, if they search you know, specific terms. And if, you, if you're searching for like all materials using this license. And then it also has a legal code that if you click on it, it takes you to a web page that explains in kind of plain language what the license means if you're unsure of what that icon is and it also explains in legal terms what that means so it stands up in a court of law so those are the features of creative commons that make it very powerful and useful and one of the reasons why open michigan uses them and a lot of other organizations use them as well so does that make sense So these are the different licenses that Creative Commons um, has created for us to use. And Open Michigan doesn't use all of them. So and I'm going to explain the ones that we do use. 
the ones at the bottom with the little ending, those are a license that says you can't create derivatives. Which So if you wanted your, your information, your product to remain completely intact and not be translated, not be you know, quoted or pulled out and maybe mixed or adapted with other resources, then you would do something like that. But because Open Michigan wants people to be able to do that if they need to, so if they want three of your slides, of your five slides, or something like that, they can do that. And they can create their own slide that has your resources, has you properly cited within it, but doesn't contain the whole set of courses that you, or materials that you used in your slide presentation. So these are the licenses that we use. This is the very, the very um, basic one. It's the most open one. And so if you've got handouts, this will give you um, an explanation. It's the same explanation here that you can take with you. Um, CC BY means that you have to give credit for the work that you're using that falls under this license. So things that are created by the University of Michigan, things that are created by professors, you need to properly credit them for the work that they've done. And the, the by is always attached to any type of Creative Commons license that you use. So um, it's, it's created and, and organized for maximum dissemination and use of the materials. So let's say in the case of PowerPoints, you pick, like you said, three or five. Mm -hmm. um, it has the citations to be on every, on all three of those? Or you put it one place or the bottom? You can, so there are different practices. But um, we try to put the licenses on um, any, any object that is like a quote or a picture. We'll try to put the license and the, the um, links content to those pieces so that you can pull that out and you have the license. But you can also create an attributions page, like a bibliography works side the page at the end. Um, so it kind of depends on what you want to do. And there are varying degrees of the, the best practices. Um, so like, for example, I try to put you know, where I, I cited this information from and the link to it so that if you open up my PowerPoint presentation, um, you know, I've, I've already put this on SlideShare, you can click on that link and it'll take you to the page where I got this information. So, so this one is um, attribution share alike, which means that when somebody uses your work, they need to apply the same Creative Commons license to it, that you would like them to keep attributing you for the work and to share it under the same, this, the same agreement. So it kind of tries to foster that good practice of using these licenses and attributing your work. So it's, it's kind of to encourage that behavior. It's created to encourage that behavior. But it also allows you to, so, so CC BY and CC BY SA allow you to use the work for commercial purposes. This one, CC BY NC, doesn't let you do that. So it says, you can use my work, you have to give me credit, and you can't make any money off of it. So same for like Apple couldn't use it to make money for a commercial or something like that. And a small nonprofit that does a subscription-based service because they need to make money to survive can't do it. So it's, in general, you know, it, it makes sense because you don't always want your work to be used commercially and other people to profit off of your work, but in some cases it might be problematic because of the, cir the specific circumstances. Um, but, and, and that's, that was, you know, the library initially had the NC license on, the non-commercial license on their work, and they actually decided to take that off because they felt like, in certain cases, there were important reasons why people might want to have a subscription fee or something like that associated with some, some sort of content that they create and share to others. So, so, but we allow this license. So if a faculty member doesn't want, wants to make sure that people don't make money off of it, they can still use this license. And that tells people that they can't use it. And this is the one that you'll see sometimes in the news. So there will be occasionally like Apple or who knows, a larger organization will use um, an image or something that someone's created and applied a Creative Commons license to it that says you can't use it for commercial use and they've there have been ramifications. So that's kind of the question that y'all were talking about is what happens if you get caught? 
you, you get cut and you you know they have to pull an ad and they can't but they're you know what the, the legal steps are for that but they legally cannot use those things so so this is a um, combination of all of the three that we just talked about so that's one of the benefits to Creative Commons licenses is that it allows you to dictate the different choices that you want other people to have when they access your information and your materials and when they think about using those materials. So um, that is something that we think helps people learn about copyright, but also gives people alternatives to that all rights reserved you absolutely have to ask me for permission anytime you want to use this um, issue with this that's present with traditional copyright. So, and this is because the more implications, the more decisions you put into this um, means that you know somebody has to follow these specific rules. These are a little bit more closed in the way that you can use them than, for example, the um, Creative Commons attribution license that only says that you need to give credit for it. So those in the circle, those are the licenses that Open Michigan uses. And these are the things that we think that these licenses afford us when we create materials that have these licenses. And we've seen different instances of these. So, so does anybody have questions about copyright? I'm not, so I am not a copyright expert. Um, and I highly recommend that you visit the Copyright Office, the website on the library system, and or call them because they have a small staff. They're a new office, and they are experts on this, more more experts than I am. And so they can kind of answer some of these deeper questions about maybe what happens along the legal process. Um, I know these issues, but I don't know. I'm not trained in law, so I know kind of basic intellectual property issues. It is amazing to have watched how this has grown. Just in the last five years, mm -hmm. uh, uh, something I thought well, wasn't that nice, but then all of a sudden everybody's using it. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. It's true. And these codes are showing up on materials, that example little icons. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, they're really they are they're great because they have that embedded those different layers into it, so that they kind of are that visual cue that you have applied these terms. To the work that you're creating. And then they also have that, that legal information behind them and they do make things more findable if you link them correctly. So, okay, so that's the, the big, like, really bulk of the um, presentation of kind of the, the big background, the why of what we're doing, the how of what we're doing, the big picture of it, and now I'm going to move into a little bit more specifics about the Open Michigan Initiative and how we create materials and how we use them. So I'll give you a little bit more specifics. So, so now you kind of see, hopefully you look at this and you kind of understand the reasons that we've applied the little CC BY license at the bottom. We include you know, the, the person who created it was Garen, and we try to include links to the different resources that are kind of form the ecosystem around the course and why we make all of these kind of able to be downloaded as a whole or able to be downloaded in sections. So, um, and, and also, you know, why we think that it's important for the University of Michigan to um, incorporate not only learning materials associated with a specific course, but also incorporate reading lists or different kinds of quizzes or tutorials that people create. So, so this is what our, when we publish OER at the University of Michigan, this is what it is presented like. And then, oh, um, these are, this is like the slide that we put on all of our materials so that you can see how we use, what we use and how we use it. So it gives you just a short definition of the different kinds of icons that we use and the different things. And, and the CC ones, the black ones, are Creative Commons, and the other ones are ones that we created to kind of promote that good behavior and to kind of match that, that visual cue that this is something that falls under a specific license type. 
the PDs are all um, public domain, and they can be public domain because they're government, like we've seen the example of. They can be public domain because they expired, their copyright expired, or because somebody chose to put them in the public domain. Who's a copyright holder do individual? Um, they can put they can put a license like this on it, or they can contact like a copyright office to do something like that to say I want to. Get it. Mm -hmm. Public yeah, and and it's it's kind of the opposite of what it used to be because you used to have to register your work with the copyright office, but now that it's automatic, you don't have to do that. But you have to go through the process of saying, declaring it that you want to do, you want to um, contribute it to the public domain. But the easiest way to do it is to um, Creative Commons has a new license that allows you to do that. So it functions the same way as theirs do and gives you that kind of legal document and the explanation and it makes it searchable and findable. So the, they've made it a little bit more easy. So this is also um, an open educational resource. And we have a link to this. It looks like our pretty home page. But this is the actual resource. And it's a website that one of the doctors at the University of Michigan Medical School created. And so he decided to license the entire website under a, an attribution, non-commercial, share-alike license. So um, it's, it looks pretty traditional, but it's been created so that other people can take it from other institutions and use it and embed it in their work if they need to or they want to. And we found that we've seen a lot of medical school, we, because we were from the medical school, We've seen a lot of students in other institutions using our resources to supplement their courses and say thank you for posting this. So it's been interesting to see that. This is also one of the open educational resources that we have worked with a faculty member at the Ann Arbor campus to create. It is another website, but it is a tutorial for teachers. So it's a, a faculty member, it's Leslie Rex, and she had been teaching for a really long time in the School of Education and had created a bunch of stuff for teachers to use. And she wanted, she had created this website, but she wanted to share it more broadly. And so she came to us and we worked with her to make sure that it was properly attributed on all of the pages. And that's one of the things that we'll do is if a faculty member wants to work with us, we make sure that they're using Creative Commons licenses appropriately, that they kind of understand those ramifications of the use of it and, and all of that. So <coughs> and then, you know, this is also another example. So this is kind of what you were asking about is if the CC license is on every single slide. Um, this is a slide from our one of our presentations that we put the title page and the end page of the materials that, of the licenses and how they're used and who created it and what license they chose on it, but we didn't put it on every single slide with text. So, um, so like, I put the person, and I, that's hyperlinked to her, the actual course that we have published, um, and the license that she chose, because I used it in this slide. So I wanted to make sure that that attribution was carried over into new materials. So, this is, again, that same uh, example that also has a blog attached to it. So other materials that are created that maybe have blogs or wiki features, thanks for coming. Okay. <laughs> um, those can also be open educational resources, too. So if a teacher is using a blog um, with their courses or their classes, or if they want to, they're considering it, they can also consider this option of applying a license, a Creative Commons license to it so it can be shared. And that, so that whoever uses that realizes that it needs to be attributed, or ho hopefully realizes that. And so we think that this really relates very strongly to the, the specific Michigan, um, or the specific um, Flint mission at Michigan, um, because these are all different kinds of communities. We have a, a few different types of priorities, but especially the aspects that you are participatory and kind of experience-based um, campus and the commuter campus. We think that this is something that can be very valuable for the resources that you create for your students to use and for other uh, students, self-learners or institutions that are similar to Flint can use the resources. So I'm going to switch gears again a little bit. 
and talk about the ways that you can actually search for and find and create open educational resources in your own practices. So, a little bit more time. Um, one of the ways that you can do this is by searching for stuff. So if you're creating a presentation and you want to use images, like all of the images that I used in this presentation are licensed under Creative Commons licenses. And so that's becoming more and more easy to do. There are a couple of dedicated search engines that allow you to do this. And those are some of them. We have um, this handout that we have created to give people um, the links and the resources to what, they're, what they want to search for. So you can go to these websites and you can type something in. So we've tried to help people out by providing something like this. And you can also um, search using the advanced search feature on a lot of things. Like Google allows you to do, do this now. Flickr allows you to do this. So you can actually say, I want to search for Creative Commons licenses that allow me to adapt the work. So, so those people have given you permission to use their resources or use their, their images or whatever in your work. So you don't have to worry about copyright infringement. This is an example of um, Creative Commons Lab that they have created a search that allows you to search across different platforms, which is really nice. So you can search in Google, Flickr, Lip, and these other places with Media Commons at the same time, so you don't have to go to each individual one. So this one's pretty convenient. And that's kind of what it looks like. That's what the interface looks like. And this is kind of what we were asking about, is the different ways to cite the resources that you're using. Um, you always want to try to make sure you do use title, author, source, and license in the materials, but you can do it in different ways. So you can kind of put it, you can use the little icon if you want, you can use the little CC by, you can just say that if you want to, you can, so that's, that's this, which is the same thing as this. Um, this is just spelled out. This is the source, and you know you can also include the whole entire um, web link if you want to. But the main thing is just to make sure you include the author title, source, and license. And then if you have a presentation where you don't want that to like clutter up your page or something like that, you can we encourage people to do an attributions page, which has all of that information in the slide information. So it's like a bibliography. And then, in a lot of different ways, you can work with Open Michigan. If you want to publish your resources, we are happy to host them. We are also happy if you have a website that you've created or something that's being housed in a, in a relatively stable place that would be hard to replicate on our site, we can also set up kind of a front door page to it. And one of the benefits to that is that we work with larger repositories and we actually push our content to those repositories to make them even more findable than what would be findable on just a regular Google search. So we push that to a, a different level by um, working with these different partners that we have. So, but, you know, you can say that you have work, you can publish work in all of these places and you can put Creative Commons licenses on them and often like on YouTube and I know on SlideShare there will be a feature that you can click and say this is, I want this license on it. So you don't have to just type it in, but you can always type it into the, the description of the work. And that helps promote Creative Commons licenses as well as giving attribution to your work if somebody else uses it on a YouTube video or something like that. So basically we have these four tips for people and Thank you for coming. Um, that is let's see, this this um, handout is the kind of just make sure you choose a license that you want to um, apply to all of your work because you're the creator of it and use open content where you can. You you know all you have to do is cite them and make sure you cite them appropriately and then try to make it adaptable. And by that we mean Put it, publish it in formats that can be edited. So instead of just a PDF format, put it in a Word format as well, or something else that somebody else could take and embed in their own work and then give you proper attribution for it, just like you've done with other resources. 
So that's one of the differences between us and some of the other um, open courseware and open consortium groups is that they don't always make their content so adaptable and we try to be really cognizant of that. So, so you can use open educational resources in your own presentations, you can teach your students how to do it, you can incorporate these in a lot of different ways in the, the resources that you create and you can think about instead of creating a resource that is only shareable by between your department or within your classroom, you can think about using these Creative Commons licenses to make them shareable and adaptable in wider contexts so that they can be used by teachers and learners and students in other places. Is, is, is Open Michigan available just through a Google search or is it through a library? Like it's available through Google search. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have university credentials to download the materials. Mm -hmm. What about the partner organizations that you said mm -hmm. that those are available Same. Just, just through, we can come through Open Michigan and find those partners? You could. Either works or we have to go to their sites individually. So, so like the ones that I was mentioning earlier? And you said Stanford. Mm -hmm. You can just do a Google search for those too. So if you if you typed in like the university name and you typed in Open Courseware or Open Educational Resources, you should be able to find their programs. So, And the, it should be the same thing like at, you know, for example, on MAC's website, you just go to the website and then you have the list of all of the courses that they have and you just click on them and they only have their work in PDFs right now, um, but which, you know, um, that's one of the reasons why we make ours available in uh, Word or open office formats, um, but you can still, you know, download the materials and look at them and, and use them, so. So it's all it's all openly accessible as far as a search goes. It's not embedded in like our library system or anything like that. Can you give us a quick tutorial on how to use the attributes page in EPA format? I don't think it's in the latest edition. <laughs> yeah, probably, I, I probably could have a couple years ago. But I know, and that's one thing you know, because this is emerging. the The standardization is still coming on a lot of these issues. So like. Creative Commons has their, their way of citing things and we're trying to kind of make sure that at least we have those features on the work that we create. And so I think that that is coming, that's continuing to come and continue to be more popular, but it is a growing field, it's an emerging field. Um, but so now that you've been exposed to all of this kind of stuff, these are the different ways that you can partner with Open Michigan if you want to work with us. So. We don't have a huge staff. We have a couple of people working and we have a lot of part-time people. So we have come up with a model where we train volunteers most of the time. Um, sometimes we're able to pay them a little bit of money, but most of the time they're volunteers. But most of the time they're students, but they can be staff members and sometimes they're faculty members. And we give them specific training that a little bit of it was touched on today about how to recognize copyright issues, so how to recognize copyright, copyrighted materials, and how to apply, search for uh, open licenses, or um, search for materials that have been openly licensed to put in their place, or how to create resources that can be openly licensed. So they will often, they'll take what is usually course material, or a resource that maybe a faculty member has created, and they will do the clearance process and they, we've created a software system that they can use called Orca, and it allows them to easily upload content into it. It pulls out all of those pieces of materials that may be copyrighted, and they get to make the decisions on that, and then we check their work. So um, we make sure that the decisions that they have made are always appropriate and correct, and we do work with a general, the general counsel at the University of Michigan. So we have a couple of lawyers that we ask questions of if we come up with something that we don't know or we think we're pushing the boundaries, we'll make sure that that's okay with kind of the University of Michigan in general. So um, the materials that we would publish through this are legal and appropriately formatted and appropriately cited and credited for the information. So um, it's, um, it usually is a process that can take anywhere from just like a general semester um, to a little bit longer depending on the student's um, involvement or sometimes it can take just a couple of hours depending on the size of the project that you want to work on as well. 
but that's usually what we would do. We would pair you with a volunteer or somebody who has been trained in this process so that you can work with them, but you don't have to learn it yourself if you don't want to. But we have had faculty members who have gone through the training and who clear their own content and then create open educational resources from the start after they've been trained in this process. And so we also do consulting. Um, we, like I said, we have developed a software toolkit that you can use that anybody can get um, a password for. So you just ask us and you can get blogging credentials and you can use it for your own resources, this clearing tool that we've created, or um, other people can use it. We have, we have now a global Describe um, initiative that have, we have trained other people at other institutions. We work with um, Peru, we work with Berkeley in California, we work with a couple of a South African institutions, and those people have taken this model of training volunteers and taken our software and they're using it in their own context. So it's been it's spread to a couple of different places. And um, we also so we offer that publishing um, ability so that if you have something that's just on your home computer or your work computer and isn't linked to the internet but you want it to be published and available, then we can publish it on Open Michigan. And we always deposit all of our resources in Deep Blue so that they are available and in a stable place for a long period of time. And we develop all of these kind of DIY resources. And we also support other projects. So if you have a project that you want to publish or that you're working on, but you don't not quite know how it should work or how to apply the Creative Commons licenses on it, or things like that, we can help with that. So we've worked with student organizations that have created handbooks for each other. We've worked with um, other like open journals that people have created. We've worked with open textbooks. And we've worked with kind of brainstorming how faculty members can take advantage of these digital publishing opportunities and make them licensed so that they can be shared. So we do a lot of those kinds of things. And like I said, we also have this wiki that we've created that's kind of our work space that um, you'll see, I cut it off, but there's a staff workspace so you can see all of our notes. We try to be very transparent about our processes. And then you can see um, our information about our software, the d program, and then there's also a, a research and design unit that I had to cut off as well. But, um, but this is a place that you can go to if you want to, to get access to the materials that we've created for people to learn how to use the resources, um, to learn how to search for and find and create open educational resources. So this is, this is kind of the website that we have is mostly our publishing front, and this is kind of our workflow front. So those are two valuable places to go. So, these are the questions that Andrea posed, and we have 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so I just want to open up the floor to y'all to get your impressions about this. If you think this is a totally, you're all on board, or this is totally radical and ridiculous, or if you, know, you think that it makes sense to work with these kinds of things in your own teaching and learning context, or, or what your impressions are. So. I think it would be marvelous and all of our faculty and from a selfish perspective we often have requests from departments to allow a faculty member to see someone else's course someone who has mm -hmm. departed the university is no longer going to be teaching mm -hmm. yeah. and they want to use that material mm -hmm. and we don't as a rule just give open access to that type of stuff mm -hmm. and it would be so nice if we're all open We've had faculty members come to us because they have they want to leave their legacy. Basically, they have this whole body. They've they've done research and they've been published, but they have this whole body of teaching materials that they put a lot of work into, and that they want to share those and continue to share those. And that's one way that we can facilitate that. So. And we have found um, on campus, we found we have students who have used our materials to actually make decisions about applying to the University of Michigan. They are interested in a program and they want to check it out and they look at the, the work that is there and that has helped them make the decision to come to the university. We also have students who are currently enrolled that are looking at classes to take and they use this to see what classes fit their schedule or you know fit their
goals and their priorities in their education as well as fit their kind of learning curve to see if it's appropriate. And, and we also have students who use it um, who are at the University of Michigan to um, supplement their courses to kind of say, okay, I'm taking this class now, but what was last semester's class like? Or you know, how has this changed? Or what else can I learn? And so as a, as a teaching supplement for students, it's been very valuable. So there's a lot of benefits to a lot of the different participants in this. What strikes me is just sort of the generosity of spirit about all of this, that information is meant to be shared, you know, with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And yet there does seem to be, among the, a lot of the faculty I know, for some reason, I'm not even sure why, this feeling that they should keep their stuff close to the chest. And, I'm, and I'm not sure what that's all about, like what would happen, you know, if it got out there, what would happen there? Would that mean somebody would steal your work or, you know, I mean, there does seem to be still some sort of old-fashioned, less generous impulses that are, that are in the air. Mm -hmm. I, how do you, do you get that from, how do you respond to that? Um, we, we, we have, we have to say the same thing we said to you, we're not a policing agency. We can't say you can't use the resources because you're misusing them. Um, but we also know through, because a lot of institutions are participating in this, they've done different types of research, they've encountered different experiences with the feedback from their users, and we have not really encountered people misusing the work that we've seen so far. We've encountered the expression of, I've used your materials to fill this gap, or because of this, or I want to partner with you because you offer this, you have this expertise, and we don't, or we want to build that, how do we do that? And so, those are the responses, but it's it's really, it's, it fits into the same, kind of what we were talking about before, it, just because you have published your resource in or your, your journal article in a specific journal that's peer reviewed that you give them copyright doesn't mean that it won't be misused. And so it's really the same argument, it's just from a different perspective. And so I think that that's hard for people to address. But we do, we do get that. Um, and you know, we, we are not policing it, we can't say that. But we can say what we're trying to do is make it very obvious through these visual cues, through proper citation, through proper re you know, resource management, that these are the ways that you can share this, and that this is good practice. So, but yeah, people, you know, just anecdotally and, and with the, the research that other institutions have created, they've just found an overwhelming and positive response to the resources. So across the United States, is that decision always up to the faculty, the, to the instructor, or? What decision? Let's say they created uh, materials for a class and they wanted to make it, uh, to license it through Creative Commons, to even maybe give it to Open Michigan or to give it to some other sharing organization. Mm -hmm. Is that decision always up to them? Or, I mean, they're employees of the university and can the university say, no, all material created as an instructor for this university, you can't do that? Way. It depends on the policy of the university. Yeah. So the University of Michigan, they faculty own the copyright to their work. Um, but other universities, they don't. So as a staff member, I don't own the copyright to my work. So all of the things that we create, you'll see that um, in my title slide, I didn't put this as copyright, you know, Creative Commons license Emily Puckett Rogers. I put it as the Regents of the University of Michigan. And that's what all of our stuff is, is the Regents of the University of Michigan own the copyright to these things that we create. So, but the copyright is still owned, but the license, we get to decide the license, the Creative Commons license. We get to decide how we want to share it because they still own the copyright to it. So we're not, when you apply these licenses, you're not giving away your copyright. So it's just an additional information that you can add to it that's legal, that's a legal contract in a way that you are engaged in, that you are proactively giving um, permissions for people to use your resources in a specific way. If I got that right, you said that through the University of Michigan, mm -hmm. if you're faculty and you create something for a class, then you own the copyright, mm -hmm. but if you're staff, then you yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, never, never work on anything private for yourself uh, at, at work, if the university why, takes it. So that's what you saw on the, the resources staff. It's really
really, really little, but you know, like teachers who created those resources, we cite them. Like they, they got to choose the copyright, so we'll we put their name on it. So, but like our stuff, so, I can put my name as the presenter. But creative work. Um, I'm a writing teacher and and a writer, and so what is it? What's the re regulation, or what's the way of looking at it? If I posted some of my creative work mm -hmm. through Open Michigan. Mm -hmm. I still hold the copyright. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And we are not, so we have a pretty broad view of what we would like to accept to. So we we have built ourselves out of the open course fair model, where a lot of our materials are based on classes that were taught, so that's why you see that most of the time. But we're also expanding and interested in um, interested in taking material and, and publishing material that doesn't always have that association. Why we do the open educational resources? We just are still growing. So just because we're we were founded in 2007 and really launched operation in 2008, so we're still pretty new. Well, I'm interested in that last question. Too. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Are there? You know, the, that's a big issue right now. Is what counts as publication? Mm -hmm. uh, is there any? Do you have anything to say about? influences on of people publishing things this way mm -hmm. that might be getting a lot of use and readership that are not regarded as tenureable publications right. as ethical? Um, it has come up and, and I would um, point you to the activities of the scholarly publishing office at the University of Michigan in publishing because they've been really um, active in providing these, exploring these different alternative um, gateways and avenues for but the open, it, it's, it's changing, and I think, honestly, that this is new, but it's going to be a, it is already starting to be a very viable and respectable way to publish your information. Because the, a lot of open journals, even though they're open, so they're free to access, and they may still, some of them still use the all rights reserved status. So you can still publish and retain your copyright, and you don't always have to use Creative Commons licenses. So that's like part of the open access movement. Mm -hmm. So they're free but and accessible, but there's still that copyright component. But a lot of those journals are peer-reviewed, and they're starting to gain that reputation that has been built up in the traditional publishing world. And so I think that that will continue to grow as these become valid avenues of publication. And, mm -hmm. and especially as, you know, as universities are realizing, as all of these things are turning into digital resources and are online, just you don't need that publishing infrastructure the same way that you used to. And we're exploring at, on our campus different ways of promoting <coughs> the research that has been produced and the teaching that's been produced at the University of Michigan. So, so a lot of you know house department journals, house journals are kind of cropping up as an alternative to this as well. So. Emily, if, if we put materials on Open Michigan, mm -hmm. and then some of those same materials are, are in articles that we submit to scholarly journals for publication, how does that affect, you know, they, they want fresh material that's not been published before, right. and mm -hmm. they want copyright to it, so how does this interact or interface with the requirements that's a good question. It, it, yeah. So that's true with creative work too. Like if I put something on my mm -hmm. personal blog, mm -hmm. right. a, a poem, right. a lot of places count that as publication. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's something um, that you know, the contract that you sign or that you would like to sign with that journal dictates that. So we would have to take it down. So because they would own the copyright if they if they if in the traditional structure where you give your copyright over to the ownership of the journal, then you don't control it anymore and you don't own it anymore, so we would have to take it down. Yeah, so. yeah. But what, what about the fact that it was there? Yeah, Someone could true. have used it, and now it's, you know, it's kind of leaked. Uh -huh. Yeah, there are faculty members who have concerns about that. Like They want to monetize their, their products, and so they, they want to figure out ways to make money. And I think that's where what we were talking about with the um, non-commercial aspect of the Creative Commons license that we're trying to figure out if there's a way to, to make this number one sustainable and to also afford faculty members some um, kickbacks or some opportunity to make a little bit of money from this by print on demand features 
and those kinds of things. But that issue has not quite been, I don't think it's quite been resolved between the publishing worlds and the open educational is, resources. Is there a line of communication that's happening between your organization and others like yours mm -hmm. and the publishers? That's kind of where the SPARC um, comes in, the SPARC organization, and the open journal movement, the open access movement in, in the publishing world. They're, they're having those conversations. And so we are kind of a, 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 on the side of that because we focus on the teaching and learning products, so we're not focused on getting people's journal articles or things like that. We're focused on the tutorials that are present in the teaching and learning sector. So, so we have kind of we we have not head on addressed that because those are not that's not within our scope of what we're trying to collect and publish. But I think that you know it. It is something that that's being teased out and kind of like I talk about with the standardization issues and those conversations. So, but so far we haven't had, um, we, we have been able to um, promote people even if they don't publish through Open Michigan, we've been pr promoting the use of the open licenses for as long as they would like to have that material available. And then if they're in contract with someone, then they can make that decision down the road. And, remove that material um, if they, you know, they have it on a page that they, they feel like they control. But then, you know, there's the life cycle of these resources and these documents kind of because it's so easy to share on the internet, you know, it's how can you rein in, you know, materials that have been published. But, but then that would be a case where if the journal found out, you know, and they own the copyright, they would be able to pursue the individual who used those resources. And, take whatever action that they felt was necessary so to protect their copyright of the material. So. But yeah, again, I would say that would be something to explore with like the in-publishing umbrella because they're the ones that are engaged in those dialogues of how, how we can kind of balance the monetization issues of this in general as well as the, the um, ecosystem of faculty members getting not just credit for their work, but also getting money for their work to get that, that financial um, opportunity. So, yeah. But that hasn't, so far, you know, we don't, we've published um, student journals that are not, they're not incentivized to make money off of them or have subscriptions. And we actually were just thinking about, there are, there are some people who have approached us a little bit about manuscripts and we're kind of, we're saying we, we would be happy to host that, but we not, might not be the best place for that right now. And, but if they own the copyright to it, they can decide, they can make that decision later if they find a better place for it. So, um, and we're happy to, you know, that's one of the aspects of working with Open Michigan is that you have a staff that can take that stuff down or do, they can curate it. We can curate it a little bit better than maybe um, if you just put it up on a department website and then you leave or something else happens and nobody remembers that it's there. So. Did that reminds me, maybe I missed it on your graphic, but does your staff work with the contributor on like the appearance of it or is it just you give it to them? Um, we work a little bit. We, we don't do, you know, like design work. Um, so. Like the U of M Flint one at, at yeah. MIT or the yeah, other. No. That's why I showed you. So, you know, this is their website. That's their branding. That's the UMS, University of Michigan Medical School branding. Um, and so that looks, you know, that's going to look like whatever you produce. And so, you know, Leslie Rex's work is that's her branding. That's what she, she designed. She did it. She mm -hmm. designed it. And we, um, you know, we worked with her to make sure that the different pages were properly attributed with the copyright. So we made sure that that was um, functional and used correctly, but we didn't really give her any advice about that. But if you see this, that's our landing page to the resources. So um, that will be our branding. And then we include a, an introductory slide that has the um, faculty member's name on it. Oh, we're over. Faculty member's name on it, the course, and the license and kind of what that means. And then we have our page that explains all of the licenses that we use, and that's. Uh, and then we put the um, the Creative Commons licenses embedded in the PowerPoint presentations or the other materials wherever they are appropriate, and that's the extent of our branding that we do or, or our influence. We try to keep 
the original, kind of what the, the instructor intended or the original design. So, so yeah, yeah we're over. So uh, uh, evaluations. Can you send me an evaluation? Oh, sure. Like, right. Oh, I didn't get the one. If you think Thank you for coming. To. Okay, thanks. Feel free to get in touch with me if you have questions. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Greg.